I'm here to, today on this afternoon to talk about um, what we used to call courtship. Um, what we today I think would call dating or relationships. And I want to begin with a kind of honest confession. And that is that I have a caveat to offer. And that is basically that a lot of things that I'm going to talk about uh, today as a sociologist are things that my wife and I um, did not do. Uh, when we were dating. So it's one of those things where you, know, you see the, the doctor outside the hospital smoking, um, <laughs> recognizing that he should probably be eating something else, but there's still obviously some truth in the, in the wisdom about not smoking for health. Hopefully you'll appreciate the wisdom today I'm offering in terms of forging a strong and happy marriage uh, today for those of you who are not yet married but have some kind of vocation um, down, down the road to, uh, to marriage. And I, I want to begin here by noting that I think parents, professors, and peers, not to mention the wider culture, encourage our young adults to focus primarily on their education and their vocational, that is really their professional future, often to the neglect of preparing for marriage and family life down the road. So given that, you know, how might education and work compare to marriage in predicting meaning, purpose, and happiness among adults? Um, and I think probably, at least for this audience, you would guess that marriage actually is a better predictor, for instance, of happiness um, than is uh, your education um, or your income. So these things matter here, obviously. There's clearly a link between um, graduating, say, from UD, um, having an, a median income that's above, um, above the median, but clearly being married is a much better predictor of adult happiness in the US than these two other things that tend to get a lot more attention um, among most young adults uh, today. And then when we think about kind of not just sort of being married, but being in a good marriage, what's very clear from the data is that adults who have or have the privilege um, or the good fortune to be in a good marriage um, are much, much more happy um, than their peers uh, who are unmarried um, are in a, um, a not very good uh, marriage. So given all that, how are we doing in preparing the next generation for one of the most important sources of meaning and happiness in life? And I think, you know, by and large, maybe UD is an exception to this uh, more general pattern, but by and large, I would say our universities, our colleges, and our churches um, are not doing um, a great job. Um, they've largely abandoned the task of organizing courtship for young adults. And of course, courtship classically is a system of rules, common practices, and roles that have guided young people um, into marriage. So when it comes to courtship um, or dating or relationships today, what we find oftentimes is that young women and young men in the United States are often clueless and confused about how to proceed. And that's unfortunate because, once again, the idea is that courtship leads to marriage. And marriage, um, as Professor Wolf just mentioned, is an institution that virtually every culture has used to ensure that kids get the material, the emotional, the social, and the spiritual support of their mother and father, and that men and women order their desires for emotional, sexual, social, and material care and cooperation. Um, or more plainly speaking, Marriage is about bonding, and it's about babies. So given all this, I've got some ideas drawn from the social sciences on what you can do, both in terms of do's and don'ts when it comes to thinking about your own approach um, to relationships and to courtship in particular. So this is a question that I asked my students at University of Virginia. Um, I asked them to raise their hands if they'd like to do something that would increase their risk of divorce, uh, marital conflict, and marital unhappiness. Any takers out there for uh, this kind of thing? I don't see anyone raising their hand here. And of course, what I'm doing here is I'm leading to this idea that cohabitation is actually a risk uh, for young adults today when it comes to marriage. Um, you know, many young adults think it's a good idea to live together to kind of test the quality um, and the potential trajectory of their relationship before marrying. But in the research, cohabitation is linked to an increased risk of divorce, to less commitment um, in your marriage if you get married, to more conflict, 
um, and also to less happiness. Now, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, the more recent research on the link between cohabitation and divorce is less conclusive. And that's in part because what's happening today before marriage for many young adults is a lot more what we might call you know, complex. Um, there is you know, hooking up, there's dating, there's any number of things happening out there before marriage today. And some of those things that are happening are actually quite destructive, as you'll see in a few slides, to your odds of forming a successful marriage. So ironically today, what we see is in some ways, the young adults who are cohabiting with just one partner prior to marrying that person actually enjoy a kind of a more stable and successful route into marriage than some of their peers. So that's why this, this link is getting a little bit less clear today. But one key point that emerges from the work of Scott Stanley at the University of Denver is that cohabitation before an engagement is still a risk factor for marital unhappiness and divorce. Um, and he talks about something called sliding versus deciding here. And that basically is the idea that for a lot of couples who are cohabiting um, prior to an engagement, um, they tend to be doing so in a non-deliberative way. Um, you know, they've gotten together, they've maybe dated, they might spend some time on the weekends together, and that kind of just evolves into living together full time. The problem, though, is they've never kind of had deliberate conversations about their future together, um, whether or not they have common values, common interests. Um, and, you know, before you know it, they have a couch together, uh, maybe a pet together, um, and sometimes they even a condo together. And they've done all these things together that kind of push them towards marriage in ways that are not very deliberate. Um, and so before you know it, at some point, oftentimes they get married without having really established a common foundation that would be good for um, their marital success down the road. And so what we see in a report that we did last year, basically, is that among young adults today who've gotten married in about the last seven or eight years, um, those who did not uh, live together before making a specific commitment, um, either an engagement or actually the wedding itself, um, are more likely um, to be happy, that's those on the left, um, than those who live together before making a commitment um, related to marriage, either in terms of being engaged or being married, um, that's uh, the group on uh, on the right. Another thing that comes out in the research is that multiple partners um, are not a, a path to um, a strong marital future. And this is somewhat of a paradox, right? Because in many things in life, the more experience you have, um, the better you do, okay? So if you're you know, playing soccer or playing baseball or lacrosse um, or tennis or football, um, or if you're kind of moving, you know, as a young person um, to a professional future as, you know, as a doctor or lawyer or teacher, um, typically having more experience in some domain is a good thing. Where that's not the case, uh, particularly for women, is when it comes to um, a sort of a, a series of intimate partnerships uh, prior to marriage, including, for instance, multiple cohabitations here, um, as this slide suggests. So having more partners prior to marriage is linked to less marital stability or more divorce and to less marital happiness. And this gives you a, um, a sense of what it looks like for women when it comes to their, their odds of being um, in a high quality marriage. And we see here basically is that the women who have um, only had sex with their future spouse, um, either before marriage or after marriage, have the highest marital quality. Um, and that women who have more partners have less marital quality, and especially those women who've had 10 or more partners have the lowest level of marital quality um, in, in the data on this particular question. And the question here is, what is, what is, you know, what's going on here? And certainly I think part of the story here um, could be a kind of a selection effect. That the types of people who have multiple relationships prior to marriage may have some underlying risks that they carry into married life. Uh, but I also think there's a kind of a causal story here where, you know, the experience of having 
uh, being close to someone, breaking off relationship, being close to someone else, breaking off a relationship, can give people a kind of emotional baggage that they carry into their marriage um, and is a source of, um, of difficulty for them in married life. We also know that we're creatures of habit. And that if you've kind of established a pattern of in the face of some kind of difficulty or challenge of breaking off a relationship and starting a new one, you may carry that very same pattern um, into, into your marriage in ways that obviously wouldn't be so um, helpful or productive. And then finally, too, it could be the case that people who've had a lot of relationships prior to marriage are more likely to kind of critically compare their husband or their wife to, you know, boyfriend A, boyfriend B, and boyfriend C, or girlfriend F, G, and H. And, of course, not intentionally uh, necessarily doing this, but sort of often comparing their spouse to those different boyfriends or girlfriends on their um, best qualities. Okay, so that can you know set up your your spouse you know for in a sense a kind of failure um, if you've had these experiences with uh, lots of boyfriends or girlfriends prior um, to uh, to marriage. A related point that comes out in terms of things to do um, when it comes to uh, dating and courtship is to take things slowly. And this is based upon some work in part by Sharon Sassler at Cornell University. Um, and what she finds basically in her work is that moving quickly into sex and cohabitation may not give couples enough of an opportunity to establish a strong foundation of communication, trust, and emotional security. You may have been exposed to this idea of attachment uh, for infants and toddlers and their parents, that they need to have some kind of foundation established with them as they grow in intimacy with their parents. And we're seeing more and more in the research on adult relationships is the same basic idea applies to romantic relationships. Uh, and that is that it's better to have this kind of foundation of communication, mutual knowledge, trust, and a sense of security in your relationship before you move on to real emotional intimacy um, and real physical intimacy. Whereas today, of course, a lot of young adults take things very quickly. And the hookup is probably the best example of doing that. But it also can be the case, too, emotionally. Some people move very quickly emotionally into a connection with someone when that's really not the most prudent course. So the point here simply is to take things slowly, get the foundations built in your relationship, um, and then proceed to some kind of more deeper emotional and physical um, intimacy. So one <clears throat> empirical example of how this plays out in the real world is that if you have a history um, of hooking up with your future spouse, um, you're less likely to report a high quality marriage um, in your first six or seven years of married life, as the slide suggests. And then some work done by uh, Jason Carroll um, suggests that um, basically the longer couples waited to have sex, um, the more likely they were to report um, stability in their relationship, a high quality sexual relationship, um, better communication, and more satisfaction in the relationship. And of course, the, the ideal point here is reserving sex for marriage, okay? So obviously, at a place like UD, you may have heard a kind of moral argument articulated around these questions. What I'm trying to do right now is to sort of show that there is some science that suggests there's a kind of a rationale for this um, in terms of getting to know someone, uh, making a good decision about being with a particular person, and then you know, moving on to um, sort of the fullest expression of that intimacy um, in the context of, of married life. Okay, turning to a don't. You know, I think one of the things we often get from parents and from peers in the broader culture is that, you know, your 20s are really a time for fun and for exploration, um, for getting your career kind of launched. Um, and you can kind of think about marriage, you know, in your late 20s and early 30s. That's really a time to marry. Um, but what I think a lot of young adults don't realize about that kind of conventional wisdom, um, which has you know, some merits to it. It is the case that if you postpone divorce, sorry, postpone marriage um, to your late 20s or 30s, your divorce risk comes down um, a bit more. 
if you think though about marital happiness, what we find is that the happiest marriages are made by young adults who are getting married in their mid-20s, where they've achieved a, sort of a measure of maturity, um, but they're not too settled in their way. So it's not kind of a, really a confirmed bachelor and a confirmed bachelorette trying to form a partnership. It's really about two people establishing a common way of adult living together you know, in their mid-20s. It's also the case, too, I think, that one reason why there may be this link between you know, a mid-20s marriage and marital happiness is that those couples haven't had the opportunity to accumulate um, a series of previous relationships which might color the success of their marriage for reasons that we've just gone over a few slides um, ago. So what we see here in the data is that, um, in this case, young women who get married in their mid-20s um, are more likely to report that their marriages are very happy um, compared to their peers who marry earlier and their peers who marry later than that. Another don't is don't rely on chemistry. Um, because we know that men and women are often attracted to um, people who you know, have really nothing um, in common with them. There is a kind of a physical and romantic rush associated with, um, you know, with this attraction. The problem is that it, it's not linked to any kind of deep uh, marital friendship, what we call sociologically a kind of um, marital homogamy here, where you're um, sharing similar interests and values in ways that sustain a marital friendship. Um, and the, sort of the example that I give is that when I was a fourth year at the University of Virginia, um, the head of the college Republicans, uh, who was an attractive uh, Irish guy with red hair, um, dated um, an attractive blonde who was involved with the alternative progressive student newspaper. And there was a lot of chemistry going on between the two of them for that you know, month or two. Um, but they had nothing in common. And thankfully, they, they didn't go on you know, to sustain that relationship. Um, I think, I also know though, actually, you know, two couples who attended an evangelical college um, in, in Illinois, in Wheaton, who had the same kind of chemistry, um, but again, they didn't really have a strong marital friendship. Um, and those two couples did go, they graduated from Wheaton, um, got married shortly thereafter, um, and then about 10 years later, both of them got divorced. So this kind of thing can affect, obviously, students like yourselves, too. So I think the, the point I'm making here simply is to be very deliberate about making sure that there's more than just physical attraction connecting you to someone as you think about marriage. That you have some real common interests, um, common hobbies, values, expectations that will sustain you over the ups and downs of uh, married life. Another point is, is be aware of some warning signs um, in relationships. Um, we know, for instance, that stonewalling is a concern. Having a partner who retreats in the face of conflict or challenges or requests for change is not a good thing. And which sex is more likely to stonewall, would you guess? Men, you've got that guess <laughs> correctly made. Um, also, you want to be steering clear of someone who nags a lot. And which sex, again, is more likely to nag, do you think? Women are more likely to nag. So, you know, saying things like, you never, or you always, you know, these kinds of comments are not very helpful. Um, and more generally, what John Gottman, this is, all this stuff comes from John Gottman, he's a very famous psychologist at the University of Washington. His bigger point is that when you're in kind of the beginning stages of a relationship, when you're dating someone, when you're courting someone, you should have about five positive interactions for each negative interaction, okay? <laughs> and, he's, and he's quantified all this, right? Um, and you laugh, right? But I mean, I had a colleague at the University of Texas at Austin just an hour down the road here who was dating, um, I won't say, another colleague at another university. Um, and when you first met them, they seemed, you know, positive, both attractive people. Um, but unfortunately, this woman in private was very negative. Um, and there was a lot of critical stuff coming up and he spent probably about six months in this relationship. He should have gotten out in the first month or two, you know. So, um, you know, these things can seem commonsensical like just on a slide on the screen right here, but you probably all know people or you yourself have experienced these kinds of patterns 
And if you have and you're not married, it's better to, you know, um, to head for the exits than to move forward um, with, a, with a marriage. And then in terms of, again, dues, um, you know, do marry someone who is capable of commitment. And I mean this really in two different senses. One is in terms of being able to sacrifice for you, putting your welfare above the welfare of his or her friends, um, and having a long-term vision of your future together. These things are all connected to a sense of being committed to you, to your relationship. But I also mean having a commitment to the institution of marriage. Um, having a sense that the, you know, marriage is an important way of life, um, and it's specifically committed to this idea of, oh, sorry, this idea of Uh, permanency. Because we know that couples who share a commitment to marital permanency um, are more likely to invest practically, financially, and emotionally in one another um, and in their marriage. And that in turn is linked to, um, you know, obviously better outcomes down the road. We also see in the data too that commitment seems to be particularly important, that is prior to marriage, is a particularly important indicator of marital success when it's um, expressed and it's embodied on the part of the guy in the relationship. And we don't know precisely why this is the case, but I guess I would just ask you, why do you think it's the case, I mean, in your own estimation, why is it, do you think that it's important for men going into a marriage to be <coughs> uh, committed? I mean, it, it matters for both, but it's particularly important for men versus women. What might be the reason in your own thinking for that uh, finding? So part of the idea here, I think, and that speaks to a sort of a broader point that's um, been made by Don Browning, uh, who was at the University of Chicago, is that men um, are often less engaged, um, perhaps by nature, with domestic things and family life. Um, and so if you can get a guy who is really focusing on the welfare of you know, his, his wife, even before the marriage, that may be um, a sign that he'll continue to work at that issue after the marriage. Yeah. Any other thoughts about why this might be particularly true for men? Yes. Yes, Rabbi. Yes. Well, maybe it's for the same reason that you didn't have the uh, men on that chart about uh, multiple partners affecting their happiness. You only have women there. So it could also be the case, too, that men are more inclined to stray, and, but a committed guy is, is less inclined to do so. And that's obviously also a big predictor of marital success as well, not straying for men. Yep. The third thing that I, I think might be also happening here is that I think today marriages are much more likely to have a kind of a soulmate character to them, where women are expecting their husbands to be um, emotionally involved and engaged, to be empathetic, affectionate, and grateful on a, a fairly regular basis, more so than perhaps, say, 50 years ago. Um, and for guys, frankly, after the wedding, it's, that can be pretty hard work sometimes. So, but if you're committed, though, to the marriage, you're committed to your wife, you know, um, that may motivate you to do that emotional work that's so vital today for a, a soulmate relationship, if you will. Another idea here is that a good man, a good woman, is hard to find. Um, and we have to look, kind of look beyond um, looks and look beyond a pleasing personality um, to see if your spouse, potential spouse, has uh, virtues like thrift or fortitude or wisdom or loyalty or charity. Because these kinds of virtues are really important uh, once you've crossed that wedding threshold and you're struggling to raise children, um, hold down a job, um, or just navigate the challenges of life more generally. Um, I'm fortunate, for instance, that I'm not a very funny guy, as you probably can tell uh, this afternoon. Um, and in fact, my wife confessed to me on the day that we, uh, sorry, the day after we got engaged, that one of her concerns about our marriage was that I wasn't very funny. Um, <laughs> but she did think that I had some other virtues that might <laughs> obviously merit um, saying yes to me when I asked her to, you know, <laughs> to get married. So in, in our culture, we kind of often think of ourselves as kind of lone rangers. And you know, if we were living, for instance, obviously in a, in a country like India, we'd have a very different approach to courtship. 
and relationships and marriage. Um, but I think there is obviously some kind of wisdom um, found in a, in a culture or a country like India where obviously the communities and the families very involved in the marriage uh, process, the marriage decision. We're not going to go obviously to that level and that's really not consistent with Catholic tradition, but I think it's, it's important to think about as you are dating someone, you know, how does my family think about him or her? What do my wise friends think about him or her? Because number one, they often have more objectivity about that person than do you. Or those hormones are not coursing through their bodies in ways that are kind of orienting them towards a connection. But also, speaking more sociologically, you know, we do know that couples who have a lot of shared friends and have the support of their in-laws are much more likely to flourish than couples who don't have the support of their friends um, and you know, both sets of, of parents. And just in terms of this is a different, I mean, it's, it's related to the point I've just made, but it is the case that we found in our study last uh, August, basically, um, that couples who get married um, and have a bigger wedding party are more likely to report marital habits. And we're not saying that having a big wedding causes <laughs> happier marriages. There's clearly a correlation, and we don't necessarily know what the causal mechanism is here. It's also interesting to, to note, we didn't have actually a measure of how much people had spent on their wedding in this report. But a different report came out about two months later um, on this same kind of story on divorce, finding again that people who had bigger weddings had lower divorce rates, but they did actually ask them about the cost of their marriages. They found that more expensive marriages were actually linked to higher divorce rates. So what you want basically is a, a big, cheap wedding. <laughs> That's what's linked to more marital stability and probably if that's also the case of a happier marriage. So lots of friends but not going over the top. Also in terms of dues, I think we're getting to the last due here, it's important to think about the role of, of faith. And you know just speaking you know in purely sociological terms, the point I would make here is that most couples now look at marriage, at least when they're you know um, 25 or, 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 you know, or, or 30 before the wedding day, as an opportunity to kind of enjoy a super relationship, a kind of soulmate relationship. The problem though with that view is it, kind of, it puts a heavy burden on the relationship because no relationship, no person is capable of providing us with a kind of ultimate meaning in life. Um, and so if you have this kind of excessively romantic or idealized approach to marriage, I think you're sort of setting yourself up for a kind of, of disappointment, you know, a kind of uh, a failure. By contrast, couples who focus on something that's larger than themselves, um, especially God, are paradoxically more likely to enjoy marital happiness and stability. And that's in part, I think, because marriage doesn't have to meet a host of unrealistic expectations. And it's also because they see marriage as an opportunity to serve someone else um, rather than as an opportunity to satisfy their own particular desires or, uh, or felt needs. And here we see that um, in, this, uh, in this study that people who had a, a formal wedding service, usually in a religious context, enjoyed higher quality marriages than those who um, you know, got married just at, at the court for instance. And then as we wrap up this part of my, my lecture, I want to just underline this idea, again, that Scott Stanley has articulated at the University of Denver, about the importance as you approach um, married life that you decide to move through different stages of a relationship, you know, towards that wedding day, that you don't sort of slide into them. Um, that you, for instance, use marriage preparation as an opportunity not just to confirm a plan, but really to determine if you should get married. If you have those shared dreams, those shared values, those shared hobbies, dispositions um, that will sustain a marital friendship over a lifetime. And if you don't, um, you shouldn't get married. We also find, too, in the research that a good premarital preparation program gives couples an opportunity again, to kind of practice the art of being deliberate 
of communicating about their future together and making decisions together um, that will serve them well uh, later in married life. So here again, what we find is that um, people who had some kind of premarital preparation, the Catholic tradition that's pre-Cana, are more likely to report higher quality marriages um, compared to those who did not. And clearly it's a pretty strong association here um, in the research. Now before I conclude, I want to just give you a few quick words about marriage itself um, in terms of the research. We talked about kind of what leads to a good marriage today. Um, and the question then becomes, once you've kind of crossed that threshold um, into married life, what are some do's and don'ts that you might want to keep in mind um, in the context of uh, a contemporary marriage? And the first don't is um, don't fall into the 50-50 trap, okay? You know, and today we do have a more egalitarian culture. Um, and that it's not necessarily a bad thing in its entirety. But one problematic dimension of that more egalitarian culture is that some people think the best way to have a married life is to have a kind of 50-50 model um, of marriage and to kind of keep track of whether or not each spouse is doing their 50-50 share um, of married life. The problem with this, of course, is that keeping score in any relationship, in a friendship, in a business partnership, um, in, um, in a marriage, you know, isn't, isn't great. Um, because you're always looking for, in a sense, how your spouse or your friend has failed, rather than kind of looking to do things together um, in pursuit of a common good together. The second point here is that taking this approach often means that spouses are not kind of cultivating particular strengths, um, particular excellences that they can do well you know, for one another and for the family. It's also the case too that people rarely have the same interests or capacities. Um, and a 50-50 approach doesn't really recognize the fact that there are these often differences um, that we can profitably um, take advantage of in a married life. And then finally, all this kind of undercuts the kind of mutual dependency um, or you're depending upon your spouse to do something well and uniquely, and that's a good thing for uh, married life. But having said that, I, I want to underline the point that equity is important. It's very important. And the, and the fact of the matter is, is that in most you know, married um, couples' lives, what we see is that women are more likely to report a sense of unfairness um, in their relationship. Fortunately, in my own research, for instance, I found it's just a minority, but still a large minority, 38% of wives were reporting that their marriages are unfair. And so the point that I'm making here is that um, in the context of kind of contemporary family life, I think men have to be particularly vigilant when it comes to um, things like childcare um, and housework and more generally cultivating a kind of family orientation, a marriage orientation that tries to make um, the welfare and the concerns of their wife um, a big deal and one which shapes how they approach um, what's going on uh, on the home front. Another don't is um, don't cross boundaries with the opposite sex. And again, it's important to, to note, I think, that in today's context, where we're a lot more casual um, and we're a lot more egalitarian, um, that's great in many respects, but it can present some challenges for people as they move into uh, relationships and, and marriage in particular, both in the workplace um, and online. And so, you know, because we have few rules governing relationships, um, kind of as a society, um, people now are often socializing, they're traveling with colleagues, um, they're working in close proximity to people um, without a sense of how to navigate that. Okay, so, you know, for instance, if you're traveling with an attractive colleague to a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, or even worse, Las Vegas, Nevada, um, maybe you don't really want to go out for drinks afterwards, after dinner. That's probably not the best strategy, you know, particularly if you're in a rough spot in your married life, okay? So kind of exercising an ethic of discretion, um, of not being too vulnerable or too intimate with you know, with people in your network or colleagues in your network, um, you know, who you find, you know, attractive or potentially attractive. Um, this is an important kind of idea to, once again, keep in mind in a culture where, you know, people don't really think about this issue all that much. And for men, too, on, on the internet, um, 
you know, not um, falling prey to pornography. Uh, because again, you're crossing a kind of a threshold there um, where you can become desensitized um, to the beauty and power of sex um, and uh, also can be kind of habit forming in ways that you know, affect you um, in different domains of your life in ways that are destructive. And there is some research, there's obviously a big debate about this issue in the, in the academic world, but there's some research to suggest that um, regular pornogra pornography users uh, lose interest in real sex, um, are more unfaithful, and are more vulnerable to, um, to divorce. In terms of dues, again, I think we have to recognize um, in a culture where a kind of soulmate model of married life has become more attractive, for men, we have to be uh, more emotionally engaged than we might ordinarily be inclined to after the wedding day. We have to be more affectionate, more empathetic, and more understanding uh, because uh, women, wives, especially today, are looking for that strong emotional connection, that kind of soulmate relationship. But it's also the case, too, um, that I think women need to recognize that their husbands are not their girlfriends, they're not their mothers, you know, they're not their sisters. Um, and so to kind of seek out some of those intimate connections with other women in ways that don't put all the sort of all the burden of that, um, you know, emotional solidarity um, on their husbands. So it's a kind of a two-way street here. Men have to do more than they're maybe inclined to do for, you know, many couples. And women have to sort of be realistic in what they expect from their husbands and seek other connections from other women. And then in terms of um, this idea of, of gender differences, it's also helpful, too, for um, women and men, wives and husbands, to recognize that there are some differences, on average, between women and men. And that rather than trying to deny them, it's sort of important to recognize them and, and appreciate them and even have a sense of humor about their existence. Um, so just speaking personally, again, for a second, I'd say in the first probably really 10 years of married life, when I was confronting a difficult article or book chapter or other kind of project, um, I'd often kind of get quiet, sort of shut down a little bit. And my wife would try to kind of probe, what are you, what are you doing? What are you working on? How's it going? And I, that just did not work. I was not happy to answer those questions. I just needed to be left alone for you know, a few hours or for you know, an evening just to kind of wrestle with the, the first, for me, the first part of writing an article or a book chapter is the most uh, difficult step. And then once I get beyond that, things tend to go fine. Um, so I basically, at some point, was able to sort of let her know that I just needed to be left alone. And, you know, and things worked smoothly on my end, you know, uh, for this thing. And, and likewise, when she was facing some kind of difficulty or challenge, I would often try to solve it for her. You know, try to tell, hey, Daniel, what about this? Or what about that? And she didn't want any of, of that. She wanted me to be empathetic. Yes, it must be really hard. Oh, yeah, I, I, gosh, I can't believe that happened to you, you know. That's what she wanted from me. And so we gradually came to understand this and understand we were different in how we approached, you know, these kinds of challenges and difficulties. And that's actually a pretty common pattern for women and men. Um, and yet, I think today, many people don't appreciate these differences. They're not taught these differences. And so they confront them in a marriage and they're just kind of surprised, well, how do we deal with this? So once again, having some recognition of these differences and acknowledging them, working with them, and, and having some sense of humor about them is, is helpful for, uh, for contemporary married life. Okay, in terms of, I guess the final point, uh, besides the point about generosity coming up, is that connecting uh, also after you get married um, to a community of, of uh, religious community, um, where you have um, friends, um, and some kind of spiritual life is also linked to higher quality marriages. What we see is that um, adults who are regularly attending church are about 35% less likely to get divorced. And when it comes to marital quality, reporting that God is at the center of your marriage is what I find to be the best religious predictor um, of marital quality um, in the United States. And even among uh, looking at a different outcome, looking at divorce here, what we see today is that for folks who are getting married younger, which in general is a risk for divorce, that risk is actually much lower um, for 
young adults who are Catholic and are attending services regularly. So again, being connected to a religious community that's providing you with guidance, um, support, um, a sense of, of direction in marriage can be really helpful. So just one final point in terms of dues. Um, the final point in terms of dues is just generosity. Um, and I've been work looking at reports of small acts of service in married life, um, also forgiveness. Um, and when you conceptualize generosity in these terms, it's one of the best predictors of marital success in America. So the, the sort of more theoretical point here is that people who see marriage as an opportunity to make a gift of themselves um, to someone else and to do that in a way that's really concretized on a regular basis, enjoy higher quality marriage. What's also interesting about this particular finding is that, um, let's see here the next, um, so people who are actually ex sort of engaging in more generous behavior are more likely to report that they're very happy in the marriage. It's true for both uh, men and from an, what's interesting here is it's actually both re being the recipient of a generous um, style of married life leads to higher marital quality, but even more so yourself being generous is even better predictor, both for women and for men, um, of enjoying a high quality marriage. So obviously today, with a divorce rate that's about 43% for first marriages, uh, marriage is a daring and even dangerous adventure. Marriage is particularly challenging because we don't have institutionalized rules to guide us through courtship um, and within marriage. So the rules that I've articulated today, I think hopefully should be of some help to you as you think about um, navigating um, a path or a wandering towards uh, the altar. And the sociological bottom line that I want to basically end with here is that this adventure, the adventure of both finding a mate, um, getting married, staying married, is best undertaken in a community of friends and family that honors and values marriage. And the paradox of contemporary marital happiness is that happiness in marriage is most likely to be found by seeing marriage as an opportunity to make a gift of oneself to one's spouse, to one's kids, and for those who believe, to one's God. Thank you.